we won't be uh, voting on those tonight. We'll have to do that next month. Okay, and Tanya, if you can just, I'm not monitoring the YouTube channel, so if you can just let me know when it seems to be on. YouTube's going. Perfect. Okay, um, 703, what do you think, Chris? Should we get started? Yeah, I think we can, uh, we can probably start it. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the uh, meeting this evening. I'm uh, Chris Sandby. I'm the vice chair of uh, SD42 DPAC, and um, I'll be chairing the meeting. Uh, Eugene was, uh, our chair was unable to make it tonight, so I'll be uh, chairing the meeting for Eugene. Um, <clears throat> as uh, we know, uh, uh, DPAC, a largest stakeholder at the SD42 table, represents uh, the parents of approximately 15,000 students across the district. So I'll call the meeting to order and uh, start uh, by acknowledging um, uh, that uh, we're grateful um, that our work takes place on the traditional and unceded territories of the Katsi First Nation and Kwantlen First Nation, and also recognize um, uh, uh, our students and their families and our communities uh, that our First Nations, Métis, or uh, Inuit. Agenda for today, um, we're going to start off with a presentation from Suzanne Perot, and I'll let uh, Suzanne um, introduce herself and, and, uh, and her, her topic, but uh, really happy to have Suzanne with us this evening to talk about individual education plans and what parents need to know about, uh, about those. So thanks for being with us uh, this evening, Suzanne. Uh, we'll then go into the reports, um, uh, some old and new business, and then pack voice and adjourn. Can I get a motion um, to uh, adopt the agenda? Paulina and seconder. Sorry, I'm just scrolling here. Katie, uh, any discussion? Um, I'll just add a quick discussion um, that we're we, uh, on the agenda. Uh, some people have noticed that we are not um, Voting on approving the, the previous minutes, that's because they're not finished yet. So, um, but we will be uh, putting them, up, putting those up for approval at the next meeting. Okay, and uh, Chris, are you controlling the polls or am I? Uh... Oh, sorry, I totally forgot. Yeah, are you able to do that? And I'll uh... see if I've got the power here. <laughs> oh, I need to, yeah, I need to do that. So give me one sec. All right, now you do. All right. There we go. <clears throat> Give it a few more seconds here. We've got 11 votes in so far. Okay. All right, agenda carries. Go. Okay, so with that, then I think we are um, over to you, Suzanne. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. We've been working on getting together for about a year now, so I uh, really really um, thankful for you holding space for me and uh, coming together tonight to talk about important conversations. Um, before we start, I'm just going to start off by acknowledging that I'm residing on the Kwantlen Kate Matsquit Semiyahu First Nations. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself before I go into the presentation so you understand a bit more about who I am and why I'm here. And um, first off, I'm going to share a little bit about my story. I am a parent first and foremost of three children diagnosed with the on the autism spectrum. So I have three autistic children who are also ADHD um, 
and my computer is now doing its thing and I'm trying to share my Zoom screen with you and it's given me a challenge. Um, so my children are diagnosed on the spectrum, all three of them, they're older children and um, they have ADHD as well as anxiety. And uh, I also identify on the spectrum with ADHD. Is it sharing now for you at your end? Perfect, awesome, thank you for your patience. Awesome, so now I can kind of be a little more organized in my brain. All right, so as a parent with three children, they're older children, they're adults now. I have a 23 year old, a 21 year old and an 18 year old. So I've been on the journey for a very long time in the, in the area of conversation of advocacy in education um, for fair and equitable education for children. Um, my journey comes into this area because first and for foremost, it started with my own kiddos and then learning that um, other families needed support. And my gifting is not numbers at all. My gifting is words. Despite the fact as a child, I was really uh, challenged by language. I stuttered. I uh, really struggled with reading for many, many years and uh, didn't come into myself until mid late teens on those conversations and um, became quite passionate about language and trying to understand it because as a child who grew up, I was uh, youngest of five, two were adopted out. I'm the first to graduate. I've met one of my adopted sisters and then I have, I had two more that I grew up with. We grew up in a single parent family in great diversity and great um, challenges in an impoverished community. And so I got to see a lot, learn a lot and experience a lot. And those conversations impact how I view the world, how I engage people and how I engage conversation of supporting and advocacy. That becomes a very important part of the journey. Um, at the end of the day, when we're looking at this conversation, I'm here for the same reason as you, children. Um, I come here because our children matter, because we wanna make sure that they're getting the education. And for me, um, that education piece became a central part of my success. And I'm having lots of challenges here, I'm sorry. Uh, so education really was my success and it really it was educators. I need to be honest with you. I had educators tap me on the shoulder and just really breathe life into me and, and build in that, that voice of confidence and that experience of what's called attachment. I didn't understand that then, I know it now. And that becomes a very important part of the journey for our kids is creating that parent uh, relationship with the school. And I'll be talking about that as well as allowing children to have that experience if it so fits. Um, so there's lots of different variables that take place. Today, what we're gonna be doing is touching on what are IEPs and what is the language around it? Um, why is this my passion? Because children, I wanna see children and families succeed. In terms of who I am in the glo global context of things, I, I go out to school districts and I work with districts, primarily educators on the conversation of inclusion. I work with educators on, on this type of presentation, but one's geared more for them. And that's very much like my TED Talk presentation that I've done. I also do trauma-informed practices with educators, opening up those conversations and having conversations around ableism in schools. So I do that with our educators and with our parents in the background. I'm doing presentations like this to provide support. I'm also a counselor and I work with women in the conversation of neurodiversities and supporting 16 plus on this conversation and the journey that we walk through. So there's a real wraparound that's happening there. And then in another realm, what I do is I'm, I'm a school trustee in a district here in the province. So everything that I'm doing is really focusing on that advocacy piece in the voice of education and children and how do we do it better and where are our growing edges and, and how can we engage those conversations? And that's really what brought me here today. The reason why I share that with you is because I want you guys to understand that I'm not coming here with a voice that's simply regurgitating information. It's coming with lived experience, it's coming with a story, it's coming with a journey, and it's also coming with some technical experience as well. That becomes a very important part of what we do and why we do what we do. So where do we begin? So we need to ask ourselves that question all the time. It's always, you know, where do we begin? We're beginning with the end in mind. And that's what I'm always working with with parents. You're always beginning with the end in mind. And so when we're talking about what is an IEP, well, the IEP should be student-centered at all times. 
your IEP focus, the goal, the purposes, it's student centered. It's there to support the student. And that's what its purpose is. It's supporting the students to guide the implementation of the learning plan. Those two items are paralleling each other. So supporting the student and guiding the implementation of the learning plan. So imagine it's a set of railroad tracks being laid down so that the child can get on and get going with the educator in order to engage in that academic process at the school along with the social emotional learning. It has a cycle to it and we're gonna talk about that. Discerning where to start is the really key point and that's gonna be starting off nine times out of 10, somebody's got a suspicion that, hey, you know, little Lee is struggling. And so it's often starting at that point. When we talk about advocacy and you're gonna hear that word frequently throughout the evening tonight, I want you to understand advocacy and activism are two very different things. And I've always seated my voice in the conversation of advocacy because advocacy is that collaborative approach. It's that approach of standing in and speaking on one's behalf versus, versus pushing against. So what I'm working towards with you tonight is going, how do we stand and speak on behalf of our child in this process, in this journey? And it's gonna be a long journey. Some of you are here and you'll have elementary children, some are middle school, some are high school. And if they're going off into university, it kind of continues, carries on. The other important piece about advocacy is it helps us stay away what's called learned helplessness. So learned helplessness is, is a, a very basic example would be an IEP being delivered to you without your input. And then you go, well, I didn't have a say and you don't invite yourself to have that say. You just accept that process and go, well, I didn't get to have a say and now there it is and it's done. Learned helplessness is, is accepting that position and being under, right? You're not collaborative. You're kind of put under that situation. It, it uh, creates challenges in our self-narrative and how we view ourselves in that conversation where our voice lies. And so what I'm going to be doing is calling you up to advocate, calling you up to use your voice, calling you up to question the process from a place of curiosity and wonder so that we can challenge those processes, challenge the things that we don't understand, go, grow in that place of inquiry. And sometimes we're actually bringing information to the table, if not often, for the educators to create that IEP. So again, so where do we begin? We're beginning with the end in mind. And at the end of the day, the end in mind is graduation in this conversation. So if you don't have a pen and paper, I wanna encourage you to get something that you can take notes because there's gonna be thoughts that are gonna come up tonight that you're gonna to wanna to have notes on and keep. As I'm progressing through the presentation this evening, you may have questions that come up, put them in the chat. There's a, I forgot the lady's name already and everything's hidden from me, but I got a lady here helping me and she's gonna inject and let me know if you have a question that pertains to this area that I'm at and I will pause and, and be present with you. Also, what you're going to find is there's going to be some information coming through the end of the presentation that you're going to get handouts on. And I will be identifying at that point. And as we go through the presentation, again, I'm going to be taking you through some processes that are, are topical. And then we're going to go into the application of what we're doing on how to create a binder for you so that you have a tool to work with. And that's your academic year binder. Uh, to walk away with, to keep your record and all your information you need to have so that you can be effective in your conversations. So I just wanted to pause there for that moment and let you know that these pieces are there for you. So back to the seven stages of a planning cycle. So the planning cycle is the same, it, and that's why it's called the cycle, because it doesn't change. There's no change to this. There hasn't been a change in the cycle for a very long time. Again, key language here coming up, and you're going to hear me repeat certain language periodically. Key language again, the IEPs, it should be there to guide the implementation of the learning plan. So it's that tool to help the educator deliver that curriculum to the student. The beginning of your learning plan is going to be the assessment. So the assessment essentially at the very beginning of the IE process is the, is the information you're collecting from your psychologist and your doctor. It's those medical assessments. So when you hear a resource teacher say, well, we need to get some assessments done, that's the initial trigger that we're looking at. And so you may see a, a, a request go into your school district for a psych ed assessment. 
Um, you might end up going to get your own private psyched assessment done through a separate psychologist. You might already be in action with um, a child development um, doctor and they can get that process started. If you're going private for a psyched assessment into something like ABLE Clinic, you don't need to be referred in. You can just call them up and make an appointment. If you're going to a place like Sunny Hill, then your developmental pediatrician needs to do the referral in. So that assessment piece becomes your, 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 your tool that everything sits on essentially. And um, when you receive your assessment, at the middle to back end of your assessment, there's going to be a section that talks about the actual diagnosis that the child's receiving. That diagnosis and the recommendations that follow that diagnosis is the information the school district and essentially the ministry is looking for. That's the information you're required to submit to your school so that they can discern um, what level category, one, two, or three your child fits into for the type of funding they're going to receive and therefore the type of supports are allowed to allocate towards the child according to the funding in terms of educational assistant hours, et cetera. So that becomes the initial part. That term assessment is going to change from a medical model to an educational model language as we continue to move through the process over the years. Your next piece is collaboration. So your collaboration piece is the team coming together. It's you, uh, your, um, whomever you're, you're, you know, if, if, if you're married, it's gonna be you and your husband or you and your wife, your partner, whomever that co-parent is, and perhaps you're, you're, you're a single parent, you're bringing in an advocate with you potentially, a support person. You're allowed to bring support people in. You're allowed to have those extra people present with you to support you on that front. Um, sometimes our support people are simply there just to take notes. And that's great because they're capturing thoughts that you might miss because our anxieties are high and that's okay. You're allowed to have that. Um, other support people on your team might be your OT, occupational therapist or your SLP, speech language therapist. Um, you may have a BI, a behavioral interventionist, or a BC, a behavior consultant. Some people have an RDI consultant or an ABA consultant. Everybody's kind of like approaching things very differently. So whomever you're going to bring, I will always want to encourage you to please let your team know at the school that you're bringing these other people with you so that they can also prepare themselves and organize that space accordingly and structure that, that IEP meeting to meet the needs of all those conversations. The other part of your team is going to be your classroom teacher, your resource teacher, potentially your principal, and potentially learning support services from the district. So those two are very um, kind of fluid for lack of a better term because they're not always needed there. So if there's a very challenging um, piece of conversation that's taking place, that's usually when you'll see them come in. In the smaller schools, a lot of administrators will join because they're just very involved and they have that ability to do that. But essentially you're working with your teacher, your resource teacher. In some IEP meetings, the educational assistant that you've been working with may also be present, but that's not required of them. So that's your collaboration team that's coming together. And what that team's going to be doing collectively with you is pulling all the information together on the needs of your child, what the recommendations are, and what kind of supports look like they need to be in place. So as we progress through the presentation, you're gonna see me talking about that part of collaboration piece because it becomes some of the, 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 the most important part of the IEP process. I always encourage the parents I work with to front load the educators before the IEP meeting. So front loading means getting information in before the IEP meeting, because we often don't get a very large amount of time. It's very restricted and limited because of the day and how it's structured and what kind of time availability is there for the educator to offer our families. So the front loading piece would look like filling out a document and you will get a copy of this on what to do on um, your strengths of your child, the growing edges for your child, your child's um, best interest, things that they're really fascinated by, especially in the in, in elementary years, in the early, early years, because sometimes those things become important and part of that, what's called universal design and learning, uh, if the educator can help build that into their learning outcomes. There may be sensory triggers. So some children are really sensitive to loud noises. There might be light sensitivities, um, touch sensitivities. My youngest child, for example, 
when he was small, we didn't have the language PDA, pathological demand avoidance or pervasive demand avoidance, depends on the framework um, then. But right now, that's the kind of language we're, we're starting to recognize right now in Canada, coming in from the UK. And that's that resistant, high resistant to transition, really struggling with transition. And that was a big piece for him. And so touch also became a sensitive piece for him as a result, because he couldn't discern if touch was threatening or not. If somebody bumped into him, he thought they were trying to hurt him. So he would go into fight flight very, very quickly. So those are some of those front loading pieces you want to be filling in on those sheets. Um, the other pieces might be your child benefits from frequent breaks. A lot of our kiddos benefit from frequent breaks. So that might be something you put in there. So that, that front loading piece becomes a really important part of that collaboration process. And it actually expedites the conversations because what you're doing is you're giving the educators insight to your child and into your mind and heart and where you think some of the conversation needs to go. You also, yep, go ahead, Paulina. It's Paulina. Yeah, it's, um, we have a question saying, can anyone start this process? Teacher, parent, EA, speech language therapist, et cetera? Only the parent can request it and the school can request it, but the support team outside on the parent side cannot put that formal request in. They can recommend it to the parent, then it's the parent's responsibility to advocate. Um, so let's say I, I've never had an IEP uh, implemented before and I just got my diagnosis and I haven't communicated it to the school because I didn't know I was supposed to communicate it to the school. That's often happens. And that, that was my situation in fact. Uh, 18 years ago. And so what happens is you go to the school, you let them know, hey, this is what's going on. And I need to meet some people don't even know what the language IEP is, they don't know it's an individual education plan. So the parent can ask and put that request in and then that starts the process going. And sometimes the parent doesn't know that process needs to be had. And an educator will come and say, hey, we need to have a meeting. And sometimes our educators don't realize their parents don't know the language and they'll be like, uh, why am I meeting going on? Did something happen, right? So that language and that collaborative teamwork becomes really, really important that communication process. So it's really between the family structure and the school resource teacher, primary teacher and or principal depends. Usually it's between the resource teacher and the primary teacher, but in some cases a principal will parachute in. So again, that collaboration piece is important. That front loading is important any kind of additional supports like frequent breaks I was going to for the movement breaks. Um, sometimes setting up goals. I often work with parents on setting up a couple of primary goals so that the, again, school knows what's on our mind as a family on what we see as a challenge. Often it ends up bending towards the social emotional learning outcomes. So how to do that connection, how to connect with self um, and all those pieces, when their documents sent in, then it becomes a great opportunity for the school to get ahead of the process, combined with any questions you may have. You may have like, you know, five or six questions, you can send it ahead of time. And then they have that opportunity to get ready to answer those questions for you. And then things can start um, growing from there. That half hour meeting suddenly becomes a highly productive meeting for you. So again, collaboration is really, really critical. From that, that writing process takes place. In your resource, in resource teacher and teacher taking copious amount of notes often. And that what they're doing is they're just pulling information in, what they're hearing, key language, um, and creating actually that the concept, the framework for that IEP. And so they're going to start working on just scratch notes there. And then they're going to go away and they're going to take all the information and work towards merging it together. At that point, that writing then comes up with an IEP, which should be presented to you to have a review on and see if there's any adjustments that need to be made. This is not for major adjustments because by this time we're looking at minor adjustments. And then we go to the introduction of that. That introduction now is how it's going into the classroom to implement that learning plan with the educator. The implementation often then comes alongside with the educational assistant who's floating around the classroom. Um, and for some kids, they have more one-on-one, -on -one, depends on the need. And that educational assistant and the educator communicating back and forth on where growing edges might occur, whatnot. In this introduction piece, moving into mo the monitoring, this is where we need that collaboration going again, where 
teacher is communicating with mom and dad, the parents, grandparents, whoever the caregivers are, to go, hey, Lee's having a hard time today. Um, you might want to know about this, whatever. And for me, I really, really implore parents to do the same uh, with the educators. So again, my youngest one, and you'll hear me refer to him quite frequently because um, he needed the most support. If he was struggling, which he did most days on transition points coming to school, getting ready for school, there was often what's called meltdowns. In the autistic world, kiddos have shutdowns and meltdowns. And the meltdowns are like the epic experience that some people say um, a child's having a tantrum. And so when he was little, he would get highly disorganized frequently. On the days he was disorganized, I always let the school know ahead of time if we're gonna be late and if he's having a hard time. And I did that so that they can prepare themselves for him coming in and they knew what to expect and they knew how to get ready. And this way, again, we started working really closely together and that trust relationship really starts working well in those situations. Then we go to the reviewing section and that reviewing part has to do again with that about combining that evaluating uh, monitoring part, pulling the monitoring piece into the reviewing. Are we hitting our goals? Do we need to adjust our goals? Where does it go? Do we keep them? And then it moves into reporting. And that reporting is where the report cards are coming. And you're going to see now what we do, unlike what we did before, we didn't get reports on the IEPs with a port report cards. Many districts now have an attachment to your report cards that let you know what's going on. So it's important to know what an IEP is not. An IEP is not a list of strategies. It's not, okay, it's made for your child. However, there's going to be some strategies like a schedule that will benefit the whole class. So, but what we're not doing is we're not saying, well, Lee needs to, um, a squishy, a squishy seat on everybody in the class should have that. So that's not what we're doing in the IEP. This is that that kind of support mechanism is for Lee only. Um, an IEP is not a description of everything that's going to be taught in the classroom. That's really important as well. And what's going to be taught to the students specifically, because there's a lot of adjustments that take place throughout that academic period where ebb and flows occur with um, developmental challenges. There's times where we're real time shifting things. Um, and to ask an educator to give a description of everything to this that, that that's going to be taught in the classroom is, is, is not a really great position to put anybody in because of that, that fluidity that occurs. It's not a tool also for monitoring or evaluating our educator. It's for the child. It's to see how our child's doing to support our child. And it's not a daily plan of activity. So it's not going to say you're not going to have a daily schedule inside that IEP plan. Inside a communication um, uh, binder, you may have a, a, like what's going to look like the basic schedule that they can expect. Sometimes the educator will put that in there, but you're not going to get that kind of stuff inside your IEP. So it's super, super important to have that in your mind when you're walking through this where I started at the beginning. And language becomes really, really important when we're walking this academic journey because as parents, we come in with a very strong medical model uh, of, of what learning disabilities and what disabilities are. We, we become masters of the language, become masters of those acronyms. And suddenly there's a slight shift and some of this stuff sounds the same in the educational system. And if we're not aware that the language actually shifted, we end up miscommunicating by accident. So understanding the language is super important and making sure that we're cognizant of that. So here we go. So an adaptation. So sometimes you're going to see the teacher talk about it, adaptations in, in Lee's outcomes. Adaptations, what, you, what I want you to understand are teaching and assessment strategies designed to accommodate the student's needs so that they can achieve the learning outcomes. They're the adaptations that keep on the best practices of that teaching. Adaptations keep the child on the dogwood graduation trajectory. So the dogwood is your diploma. There's also a certificate of completion called an evergreen. So we've got dogwood and evergreen. And it's important to understand that 
the language that I'm teaching you today, especially these first two um, points that I'm bringing up are, are impacting that outcome for the student. So we need to be aware and make sure our educators are aware. We want to assume our educators are aware. I'll, I'll have to be honest, I did a presentation up north two years ago and I had three new teachers in there that did not know the language. And those are forgivable, for, forgivable moments when you can catch it. But if it affects a child when they're at that grade 10, 11, 12, and they're going towards what we're going to talk about next is the modification. And that's on the, on the um, IEP by accident because it's, you know, a word that feels like adaptation. But what happens is it's actually moving them off the curriculum guidelines themselves. So the modification is an instructional and assessment related decision made to accommodate a student's needs that consist of individual learning goals and outcomes that are different than those that are on, on the regular course subjects. So it's modifying for them to a, a, be able to accomplish what they need. So for example, my son, my youngest, when he was younger, he didn't start reading until midway grade four to grade five. He was entering grade one um, reading level, just entering in at January grade four, high anxiety. He was really, really struggling, just having a really hard time with learning to read, learning, having a hard time memorizing. And so he was able to do math and science super, super well, but he needed a scribe and he needed a, a, somebody reading to him but he couldn't read books, he couldn't do those things. With his high anxiety and everything that was going on, his reading then and his writing was way behind. So he was not on the learning uh, outcomes for that grade four level. He was at grade one level, but his math and science was over here. So there was this great disparity going on for him. And he was a guy who really understood what was going on in his world, and he still does. And um, his high anxiety was amplifying his challenges and he started throwing up quite frequently and having, having a lot of um, conflict with his educator actually. And it was getting to a place where it was like, it wasn't good for him to be in the class for a season. It wasn't good for him. It wasn't the educator wasn't trying. There was just challenges that he developed mentally just couldn't function well. He couldn't stay regulated. It was too hard for him. It, he was constantly getting escalated. He was throwing up. So I took him out of school and I unschooled him at that time from January to September. In that time, he learned to read. He went from merging grade one to just over grade five reading level. So all of a sudden the light bulb went off for him and he came up and he was doing his thing. Had I not done that, he would have stayed on the modification plan, which would have moved him towards the evergreen, um, unless a light bulb went off later down the road. That modification in the primary years is not a dangerous thing at all. And I, and I, I don't even want to use the word dangerous because it can elicit fear. Um, but it's not a, a problematic challenge for our children when they're smaller, because they're still growing and developing. When we get to grade 10, 11, 12, when we're doing that credit system, we, we want them on if they have the capabilities. It has to be, again, the goal is with the end in mind. What is that child capable of doing? So I always want to be aware of that. Not all of our kiddos are going to graduate, and that's okay. But if your kiddo is gearing up for that, you want to make sure you're watching that language. So by grade 10, 11, 12, if it's modification, your goal you know, in middle school then is to look how can you start moving things over to the adaptation. So looking at those two different pieces is really, really important. And I stuck on that for a reason because it's really, really critical. My guy, just so you understand how the changes can occur for our kids, my guy who had speech problem, reading output challenges, uh, written output challenges, is graduating this year with minimal support uh, he did youth training trades program. He's got his level one for plumbing and pipe fitting while doing grade 12 through BCIT. So I'm saying that as a point of encouragement that our kiddos have these interesting little spurts that happen and lots of changes occur as they're going. And so take heart in this journey. Okay, so we're back to assessments now. This is where it changes. 
So we're already in the IEP cycle and we've had the assessments done at the clinical level. These assessments are the gathering information to make appropriate educational assessments for the student based on the academic level. So it becomes a collaborative approach within the teamwork, looking at the student's strengths, their needs, their goals, and coming out with the results and the identification and the implementation of the identified strategy. So again, now this is, whoops, the, I'll just leave that there. What they're doing is looking to identify the strat educational strategies in this assessment. So they're going to be looking at some of the stuff that's going on in the classroom, how the child's performing, and what does that look like, okay? And then we move on to that collaborative consultation. So I spent a lot of time on that already. Again, it's how we're coming together to solve that problem, working together. It's a really key piece of this. Part of your job as a parent and advocate. When you have a child with a disability, you're an advocate all the time, just like you're a parent all the time. That never goes away. That hat is always there. And so you need to become aware of what your child's rights are in that collaborative consultative process. And this is what tonight's about as well, is helping equip you in those conversations. So what you're gonna see me talking about at certain points, I'm gonna be pointing to what's called the Special Education Service Manual of Policies and Procedures and Guidelines. So there's a link on the Ministry of Education's website for this. And I will be providing that for you later so you don't have to try to scramble to write down the title of it. But this Manual Policy Procedures and Guidelines is kind of like um, your Bible for lack of a better word that tells you what supports and rights and services your child is entitled to. And so you wanna make sure you're aware of that. Now be also aware that not all the conversations inside this piece that comes out of the Ministry of Education applies to one child. I have three children. Different parts of it apply to them at different times of, of their developmental growth and different years. But what you wanna do in one year, have that piece in there and highlight those sections that are important for your child so that you can bring that forward if you have to in those collaborative processes so that you're demonstrating you have a good understanding. You always wanna have a good understanding of what your rights are so that you're able to move in that collaborative process properly and come into that place of curiosity and questioning and wonder with being able to also present information as well and say, well, this is what I understand about this. And, and that becomes your, your really important piece. So the integration is pulling all this stuff together. It's pulling all the pieces together so that you're using your, your strategies to achieve a inclusion with the accommodations. So the integration is moving you towards achieving inclusions and providing accommodations. And again, that service manual is one of your key tools for that because it lets you know what kind of things are available to you and why. Now, right now, when you go on the ministry website, the manual is going to have a lot of items. It's called redacted. It mean, it'll say redacted. And basically, it's pulled out. Redacted is pulled out and you don't get to see it. They're in the middle of revising that right now. And the anticipation is it's coming out this fall. This is what they're, they're threatening us with. So um, you wanna watch for that, but still have what's there now to just give you a start on that and learning that understanding piece of what's in there and the why. And then in the fall, check up again and get the new printout done. And um, I'm gonna encourage you to put that in your binder that we're gonna talk about later. And then we're back to advocacy again. That's everything you're doing. And again, it's standing and speaking on one's behalf or group. In this case, it's one's behalf. So this is giving you the foundation and the build up towards this IEP conversation. It's not all technical. Some of it's emotional and some of it is subtle and we need to pay attention to it. So we need to pay attention to uh, what we need to do to get ready for ourselves for the IEP meeting. And how do we how do we do that wraparound experience? My eldest wrote drew this picture for me. I asked them to. They're a great artist. It's their gift. And I asked them to draw this picture for me. And the reason why I have this picture here, I want to explain what's going on. When the collaborative process breaks down between the educator and the parent, the child really feels it. We may not think they feel it, but they feel it. And when our children feel the pressures of those adult 
relationships that are strained, they, re they react according to that. They behave according to that. They move into maladaptive behaviors according to that. So just like they would if, if, if that, that parental relationship in the household is strained, the child may take it on like it's their fault. And so what we wanna be aware of is how we're navigating through this conversation around the house and at the school front so that the child is not picking up the subtleties of that because kids are really, really, especially with mom and dad, they're really, really in tune to our emotions and, and start adapting themselves according to that. And some children get highly dysregulated, but either way they're internalizing it. So our goal is not to put that pressure down on them because when we're doing that, we're setting, we're not, we're, we're not being child-centered. We're not setting them up for success. And, and our intentions may not be to do that. And we might be doing our best to, to keep it under wraps for lack of a better term but they're picking up on it. So what do we do to get ready? We got to take care of ourselves. That's essentially where I'm going with this. Taking care of ourselves becomes really important. For some parents, getting ready for the IEP process becomes a point of triggering, triggering emotions and therefore bringing up stuff. And so when we talk about triggers from a trauma-informed perspective, from a trauma-informed conversation, it means things are happening in our body, things are be re being revisited. So for some families, revisiting that initial diagnosis and learning about all this stuff and being overwhelmed by the, the information and not knowing what steps to put into place and getting that binder and going here, everything you know is right here in the binder. And you're just like, oh my gosh, I can, what does this mean? And I don't understand this and it's just too much and it's, 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 it's overwhelming. And then going, how do I take this now and move it towards supporting my child? So for some of us, those pieces can be triggering. For others, it might be a fractured relation that happened at a previous IEP meeting where it got escalated. And all of a sudden you're fearful because, oh, is this gonna happen again? I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm not gonna be heard. How do I say this? How do I get ready? Those kind of things. So we wanna make sure we're taking care of ourselves and recognizing where our triggers might occur. Part of taking care of ourselves is making sure we're sleeping well, basics, eating well, and having lots of good fluids, okay? So that's that, those self-care pieces. Some other parts of self-care is going to be making sure we're preparing before the meeting, getting prepared before the meeting. So it's doing a lot of the stuff we've been talking about through that cycle process when I said front loading, and I'm gonna be coming back to it again. That's gonna be a big part of that self-care piece. Sometimes people get stuck in the thought that self-care means you know going for a walk and bubble baths and you know, playing music and sometimes self-care is getting stuff done. And in this case, it's that that's part of what it's going to be. It's about getting it done ahead of time so that you're not walking in and feeling vulnerable. The other part you need to do is start gathering your team if necessary. So do you need a speech language pathologist there? Do you need your OT there, your occupational therapist? Do you need your behavior consultant, also known as the BC? Do you need the behavior interventionist there or BI? Do you need your RDI consultant or your ABA consultant or just a friend? Does your, does your child's other parent need to take time off work to be present to be with you? Do you need mom there? Whatever it is, start getting that stuff assembled ahead of time so schedules are starting to align as soon as you find out what's going on and get them front loaders as well as what you need in there. And then what you, I want you to be doing is creating notes. So your notes are going to be your questions that you want to ask, um, your observations that we talked about, and assembling the history and your identified goals for the child. Okay, so experiences of success. So unlike what we saw on the other side where the pyramid was upside down and we see how all the pressure points go down when there's a strong foundation, the strong foundation is that parent teacher collaborative relationship, the child will always succeed. When that foundation's strong, the child will succeed. And this is how we stay student focused. We stay student centered by working, us working, try to figure out how to make that work. And I understand sometimes it doesn't work. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this, this presentation with you guys. I understand that. Um, but there's often ways to navigate through. We're going to talk about that after. So we're going to start looking at what our experiences of success mean, looking at things like at the basic level through that collaborative communication. 
And how do we get there? Where do we focus? Well, focusing on that, that preparation stage, focusing on where the impact will occur for your child. Uh, what does it mean for your child to learn? What's in the education educator's power? Really important to keep that in our mind. What's in their power to support our child? Sometimes there's things we know our child needs and it's in that document, but it might not be in that educator's power to deliver that for your child. So those are, that's, a place of, that's a place of curiosity to always come in with. Do we have the ability to do that? And then that gets married up against that special education policy manual and guidelines. What's in the power and what's in the guidelines, okay? Um, and where does that social emotional behavior piece come into place in these conversations? And how are we going to support those pathways to success to meet those outcomes that we're looking for for our child. So those pieces become really important, right? Okay, being that, creating those pathways. And again, that pathway is leading to the goal with the end, right? Starting with the end in mind. And it sounds, some people say, well, what do you mean starting with the end in mind? Well, I'm thinking about graduation. I'm thinking about where my child's going. And then I got to pull all the way back and figure out through observation over the years, it's not like you have a looking glass, but you're doing this ongoing evaluation and you're adjusting and you're adjusting your lens and you're adjusting your lens. So for example, in my adjustment lens with my middle child who is 2E, which is called also known as twice exceptional. So highly, highly brilliant young man, deep soul, super passionate, compassionate, gentle spirit, just this like, and then I had my youngest one that was like this, two polar opposites. And this guy here, really, really intelligent, always ahead of himself. And so his IEPs were always focused and seated on the social emotional piece. And I'm looking at the end of mind and the end in mind is always there. And I'm going, this guy is academically weight. He is easily a year ahead of himself year to year, year, a year to a year and a half minimum to two years ahead of himself all the time. And so I was thinking at some point, this guy's going to want to probably jump a grade because he can. So he started asking me in his very young years. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. Why? Because socially, emotionally, he just wasn't there. That was where his growing edges were. And then when we hit grade seven, he started in grade six, he started hanging out with peers a year older than him. And what was going to happen was his peers going into grade seven, he, and they would be in grade eight, which meant when they went in, he went into grade eight and they were coming out of the school, he would be alone. And I had to keep that in mind. And I started looking at this going, okay, I need to now employ my end goal. So my end goal was he might need to jump. So I advocated to the school. I need this kiddo to jump a grade. And they're like, nope, we don't do that. And I said, well, this is what we've been chasing with the IEP. This is what his reports are showing us. All the assessments are telling us he's beyond capable. You have even, in fact, and this is not an exaggeration, he was asked twice if he was plagiarizing. And I had to advocate on that because his writing was so robust. So I went, this is what we're looking at. So let's petition the district. I said, because this is what's going to happen. This guy's struggling because he's such a deep soul. If he loses his peers, socially, emotionally, I may lose him. I may create impacts on his mental health. We may create impacts on his mental health. If he leaves grade seven and goes into eight and then has no peers and nobody be around him. So we advocated to the district. And then what we did is I said, okay, here's, here's, my, here's, my, here's my negotiation card. Well, let's put him in grade eight with his peers, in grade nine with his peers. Let's do this. And then what we can do is have him do the math component only because a math component is a, is a, it's a building block. Let's have him do September to December on that. And if he's passing that while passing the other stuff, let's kick that out and keep him in that jumped grade. So they agreed expressing there might be a consequence, meaning he might not be able to pull it off. And I wasn't too worried. He was up for the task and the, the outcome would have been he would have to go back to his, his assigned grade. He did it and he ended up graduating early without impacting his social emotional well-being. So again, you're starting with that end in mind, so important. So that's, that's where I'm going with those pieces, give you a, a, a actual plan that went into place. So where do we go from here? So our personal supports, really important that the, the process starts with us. 
I want to encourage you to always be the driver of this. And that's where I go right back to the beginning on that learned helplessness piece. I want you to be the driver on this. So we're coming into September right away. Right now, um, some, some schools are redoing their IEPs or reviewing IEPs. Know that the, the, this, your school is only required to give you one IEP meeting a year majority of them will do too. And you may go, well, we always get to it. That's just because your school's doing great work. Um, so in that process of reviewing, what you want to be doing is triggering these, those processes and getting ready. And again, getting ready with starting with the end in mind. So developing all those conversations that we talked about front loading your educators and get that stuff going. Your personal supports is get them set up and have, and they need to be aligned with the challenges you're facing with. So sometimes some of our families, and what I mean by that, being aligned with your challenges at hand, sometimes even our immediate family that we grew up with, our nuclear family, don't understand our journey. And I think maybe you're just being a bad parent. And Lee could, Lee can do better if you just have better boundaries and you're like oh my gosh you have no idea what's going on here do you so that person is not a good support system for you in this journey because they're not going to understand the kind of weight you're going to be carrying when you're walking out of that meeting for many of us when we come out of the meeting we're psychologically emotionally physically our whole being is exhausted many times a car ride home is a car ride home of a breakdown because been holding it together and all of a sudden it's just like this released. And so you wanna make sure you have the right people there because it, you really need to be honored in that space. It's so important. Um, so those personal supports are having the right people in place. And um, you know if they're gonna be coming to the meeting, help them to understand what they could expect as well because that's important because it might be shocking to them the things that you're talking about and why you're talking about these things. So, and then we're setting up our goals. So we talked about this uh, and I always want you to be asking yourself, this should be your, 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 your litmus test, your question that you're asking yourself, is the goal achievable? When you guys are discussing goals, is it achievable for your child? But also understand that achievable may not mean in that academic year. It's okay and quite normal that goals roll over. Why? Because our children are developmentally delayed. It, they're, they're, so the goal, they, they may just may not reach that goal, that's okay. And sometimes those goals look the same, but the supports change. So it's going to be the same goal, but the supports start shifting underneath. And so that's okay as well. So looking at your goals, setting them up and always questioning yourself, are they achievable? And is the language in the goal supporting the learning plan okay the goal needs to be supporting the learning plan so for example i had one family i was doing some work with it's about three years ago now the little one was in a grade two three class split and really really struggling with transitions essentially um, and if too much pressure was put on the little guy's brain would shut down so when the teacher would ask him if he was doing his work and his work's getting done, the little guy would always tell him his work was done, he was doing it. But then the teacher found out it wasn't and he wasn't working. So in his IEP, it was, I'm going to use my generic name, Lee. Lee is lying in class about working on assignments. Lee will learn not to lie. And I'm like, oh my gosh, number one, it doesn't have anything to do with supporting the learning plan. Two, we're going after character. And three, we've missed the diagnosis and we missed its challenges within that diagnosis. The challenges were delayed executive functioning, struggling with transition, anxiety hitting the roof, dopamine dump occurring. And because this child was a pleaser, now projecting information out just so they didn't get into more trouble while sinking inside. We've missed the whole picture. So we had to reframe and rework all of this and go and do some advocacy work. And this kid was an angel, he really was. Absolutely lovely, lovely child. Teacher didn't have an understanding, a healthy understanding of how to frame the language. So this is where I always go, language matters. If you see me in social media, you see me say language matters, empathy matters, because if our language is wrong, it impacts how we view that person. 
almost every time, whether we're small or big. If the language is wrong, if I said, Paulina, you know what? I don't know if you're going to like Cindy, you know, because Cindy, she speaks too fast and, and she's so abrasive. And I tell you all these things about Cindy and you've never met Cindy. Suddenly you've got a purview of Cindy and how you're going to filter her through. I've impacted that. And when our language is wrong in our documentation, we start filtering that child through that lens. It's human nature. It's not because we're being malicious. It's human nature. It's what we do because we move into that place of, of judging not, and judgmental. So there's the, that process that starts initiating even when we say, well, I don't want, I, I don't want to be a judgmental person. Well, when we go, go through those lenses, that's what starts occurring. Every time we engage with somebody, we're always, even as you guys are listening to me, you guys are judging, you're evaluating, you know, is my voice annoying? Is my facial gestures annoying? You know, maybe my hair that keeps standing up over here is driving you nuts as it's driving me nuts, right? So we're going through those processes. So we want to make sure the language is set up appropriately, okay? So important, so important. I work with psychologists on that, trying to work and hit that, that community and go, how we set up language, even in assessments, can be ableist unintentionally ableist because of how we're creating that language and delivery of the diagnosis. So we need to be careful when we're setting these goals up and making sure the language is correct. I'm passionate about this stuff. Planning and preparing. Okay, so this is where you're talking to the school, you're triggering that process, you're preparing them. Yeah, I need an IEP meeting. This is what I got on my mind. You're going to start submitting that information in uh, putting in writing, submitting the doctor's reports, if there's new reports, if there's any changes. Sometimes it's important to know if the kiddo's got allergies like that. It may seem benign to you, but for some of our kids, when allergy season kicks in, they become dysregulated because they're having stress responses in their body. And we don't catch that. And when their body's having stress responses, well, what happens? They're dysregulated no different than us. When my allergies are high, I'm like, it makes me a little more fatigued. Sometimes I'm, I'm foggy brain, sometimes my face hurts, right? And we get a little bit more short with our, our thought processes. So those little things become really quite important in that planning, preparing process. So when we're submitting that information to the school, let them know those things because it helps, right? And send in a reminder also because your educator's not going to memorize all of this stuff. It's impossible. They're going to have several kiddos in their class that have an IEP and then they're going to have several kiddos who their eyes are on and their hearts on that don't have an IEP because the kiddo hasn't been caught or maybe um, the family doesn't want them assessed, whatever the dynamics are going on. So always make sure that, you know, the subtle, subtle things are being communicated forward. And that's that collaboration process again, taking that stuff forward and helping them. Self-care. I'm always going to talk self-care. Drives some people nuts, but I really want you guys to, to just focus on these pieces because they're super, super important. Our fight, fight, freeze, educators fight, fight, freeze. We're all human. We all have it. And so we need to make sure that our self-care is really, really intact. When we're building that binder, if I was with you guys in person, I would have a binder with me and I'd be lifting it up all the time and showing you. Part of the self-care going into your IEP meeting outside of the stuff that I've already said is that binder that you guys are going to create. I want you to be going to the dollar store. You only need a dollar store binder, a three ring, two inch binder. It doesn't have to be a big one. And I want you to have a, a plastic, the ones with the plastic cover and the little plastic sleeves going along the inside of the cover of the binder. And you're going to get one of those. And I'm going to talk about how to build them. But what I want for your self care in that binder I want you to put a little thing of tissue. It fits nicely in there. I know it does because I've done it. And I want you to put a package of gum or some hard candy. I want you to make sure you have a pen in there. And I want you to get something that's an inspirational quote that you resonate with and put it inside there to help ground you. So why the tissue? Well, we're talking about our external heart walking around on two legs. And when we're having those conversations about our kiddo, it's really, really tough on the heart. And there's times we're going to break down. I'm in my grade 12 year, my last kiddo. And I thought I really 
foolishly believed this year I wouldn't have to do much advocating because I'm thinking I'm at the finish line. We're at the finish line. And this year I've done more advocacy than I have done in the last three years. And I've broken down so many times. I mean, you don't want to break down in a meeting and you're sitting at a table. And unfortunately this happens. You're sitting at a rectangular table in your IEP meeting and everybody's here and you're on the side alone often and you're feeling vulnerable. Tears are flowing, snot's flying. They're looking at you, everybody's quiet. You need to do self-care. So it's either you get up and excuse yourself or somebody acknowledges it and gets up and excuses themselves. But at that point, the meeting's gonna stop, nine times out of 10. And silence will hit the room and it's an uncomfortable silence. It's not like, oh, we're having a nice pause. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I say? What do I do? And so if you have your own tissue, you're going to feel your body getting dysregulated. And you're going to know how to care for yourself in that moment immediately by getting it before it all starts so that you can start caring for yourself as you're pushing through. The other part of self-care is going, I need to take a break. It's okay to take a break during the IEP meeting okay to say I just need to pause and go to the bathroom put some cold water on this part of your wrist put both hands under the tap it's going to pull your body temperature down it's going to get your brain regulated do this with your kiddos as well it's really it's really a great technique sometimes ice cubes cold as you can tolerate as long as you can it's going to get you regulated again splash some water on your face and then you can go back and take a few deep breaths important self-care and you're probably wondering, well, why the candy? Why the gum? Some of you guys will have known this already, using gum for your kiddos in class or candy. I've been doing this since my kids were young. So, you know, they're all old and I'm older. Um, the gum or the candy helps your brain regulate subconsciously. What's happening is as you're getting elevated, you're moving into that fight, fly, freeze mode you're going into maladaptive coping mechanisms. Your vagus nerve starts firing up and your right brain, left brain stops communicating actively together. So what you're doing is you're popping this in your mouth before this all happens and your brain is going, oh, there's something in my mouth. I'm gonna produce saliva. Oh, this tastes good. Oh, I can't choke on it. Oh, don't spit it out at them, right? Sometimes we've done, many of us have spit our gum out at somebody by accident, whatever. So you were subconsciously doing all those things and what it's doing, it's forcing your right brain and left brain to communicate and it helps regulate you, but doesn't keep you regulated. It just helps that regulation process. So it becomes a really, really great tool. I use hard candies for my kiddos, especially my youngest, all the time. So I want you to have those things in mind when you're doing that stuff so that you're doing your own self-regulation coping mechanisms. Very, very important. All right, your lines of communication. Some of you might be asking, well, who do I communicate to when I have a challenge? What are my lines of communication? Where do I go and how does this work? Your lines of communication do not start with your educational assistant. It starts with your classroom teacher. With your classroom teacher, that's who you're going to express your questions or your concerns to. When you have a meeting, after every IEP meeting, after every, we don't do hallway meetings anymore because of COVID, but we'll get back there. Zoom meetings, phone calls. When those things are occurring, you're gonna send up a follow-up email saying, hi, thank you for this meeting, really appreciated your input, blah, blah, blah. This is what I took away. Is there anything I'm missing? Feel free to reach me. Simply like that. I wanna really encourage you not to load your emails with your emotions because it makes it A, hard for the educator to suss through all of that to get to what the heart of your information is. Secondly, it's not really fair for, to the educator to receive all that, to be honest with you. Um, they got, you know, anywhere from 24 to 28 kiddos in their classroom. And if all of us sent in these, these emails expressing our emotions, it, that's a pretty heavy emotional load on them. That's not a fair projection on our part. So you're summarizing, saying, thank you very much. It's documented. You're going to print that up, put it in your binder that I'm going to talk to you about. So your line of communication starts with your ed educator. Then it goes to your resource teacher. If you got a question directly for your e resource teacher, then you go directly to the resource teacher. But in terms of, you know, moving up the chain of communication, this is where we're going to go. So it starts with your educator, your resource teacher, your principal. If you're in a high school, you will have assigned a vice principal. So then it would be your educator, resource teacher, vice principal, principal. 
From there, it's going to go into your district for learning support services. And often it gets it, any kind of challenges typically will be resolved there nine times out of 10. It's a rare occasion. It has to go up to the assistant superintendent, which is overlooking your school. Most districts will have a superintendent assigned to a certain number of schools in your district. So you're going to have your teacher, resource teacher, administrator, learning support service director, assistant superintendent, then your superintendent. That superintendent is always going to be pulling this information back down to the learning support services director, who's going to be pulling it into the school and trying to get that collaboration process going again. That's always the goal to get that communication process going so that we stay student centered. If for whatever reason, there's like a human rights issue that the child is being abused. So for today, for example, there is a rally for international, uh, a rally for seclusion and restraint that took place. Those are, those are rights against the child that are being violated. So if there's something really significant that can't be resolved, then you can go towards your board called section 11. That would go into your secretary treasurer who would then bring the information towards the board so that that petition can come forward. From there, you have a couple of options. You've got a human rights tribunal, HRT. You can advocate to the ministry directly and there's also media. I'm gonna throw in heavy words of caution here. When we're doing this journey, and I've been doing it for a very long time, we need to be really, really aware of who we are, who our family is, what kind of pressures they can bear. Because when we start pushing up at that higher level, the pressure also becomes really, really hard on the family structure psychologically, emotionally, relationally, and financially. So you need to be really aware of what you can take on and what is the fight? Is the fight to be right? Is the fight to be heard? Or is the fight to have that child supported? And we need to always be sussing through that information. So for example, I had in one presentation, I had a, a parent say to me, well, I, I think this is what's going on. And they're not, I think they're not giving me the supports because of this. And I said, okay, I said, I want to pause you. I said, you said you think this is what's happening. She says, yes. I said, so does that mean you're not sure? And she said, yes. I said, okay, so what you're doing is you're projecting out a definitive with your emotions, your body's owning, and it's calling you into action. It's calling her into fight is what it's doing. And she didn't know for sure. So I said, before you go into any fight, open up the dialogue, please. Get that conversation moving because you might be able to resolve it actually if you ask that question. Because somewhere in that line of communication, that question didn't come out clearly and therefore not answered. And there's lots of assumptions that were going on. And she went, wow, and she broke down. All right. So I want you to be aware of those things. But as you're going through your year, all your communication should be printed out there uh, and put into your binder so you have it. Sometimes you have a discussion and you're, you're going to make a change somewhere along the way. And the educator legitimately forgot because they're human. And they're like, I don't remember having that conversation. And you go, oh, yeah, well, here on the email dated September 14th, we talked about it. And I verified it. Here it is. And they're like, oh, okay, sorry, my apologies, right? And then you get moving again. And so that lines of communication really become an important tool in how we activate it and maintaining those, those records of communication as well. And that's where we start talking about this binder. So I had sent in to your DPAC a number of documents on what you're going to be using for the binder. And here we go. So one of the documents is going to be this table of contents. So your table of contents is going to have your communication. It's going to have evaluation. It's going to have IEPs. It's going to have report cards, progress notes, and behavior. And then what you're going to do in your binder is you're going to go to, at the, while you're at the dollar store, you're going to get that binder I recommended. You're going to buy yourself some pens and you're going to find yourself, some of the dollar stores have really great little thin stones you can slide in as a, um, a point of encouragement for yourself to ground yourself and remind you who you are when you're feeling like you're losing your voice. Um, you're going to have dividers in that binder. And those dividers are, I want you to get are the ones with the white sleeves that you can tuck stuff into. 
And the reason why I want you to do that, because when you get your printouts, your, your stuff, you're going to print this stuff out. So you're going to have your table of contents. And then, so your table of contents, and you're going to flip your page, and then you're going to have a school contact list. Your school contact list will be your educator, your resource teacher, your principal, um, learning support services, whomever it is that you're doing your chronic work with, your co ongoing conversations that are moving, you're going to have that in there so it's readily available to you. And then what you're going to do is you're going to have a counter. Uh, I'd like to just jump in and do a quick time check. Um, uh, right about quarter after eight. Um, is this the last slide or? This is basically, yes, it is the last slide. Okay, perfect. All right, I'll let you finish up then. Thank well you. Done. Uh, and so what you're going to have next is your communication log and you're going to have a printout of that as well. So a, a little item that's going to help you identify who you spoke to on that day, who was initiated by, what the date is and the reason. So you're going to get a printout of that as well in your email. And then you're going to have letters of emails going back and forth. I want you to print out, put in that section. You're also going to receive a sample advocacy letter for emails. So what the sample advocacy letter, and I need to be really clear on this, is you're going to see it's a very full bodied email. This one, that's for a really large advocacy work. There's lots of language in there to support you, to help you understand the kind of language that's really pulled out of that policy manual. And then on the sidebar here, what you got is you got the framework of what the email should look like. So you're going to get a copy of this. So it says, thank them for the work, the why of the letter, the challenges faced, the impacts of challenges, the goals, and some collaborative resources. This is the format you follow and keep it succinct. When you start hitting the challenges faced and the impacts, I want you to start moving if you can into bullet point. Okay, so remember this large body one is for when there's really difficult advocacy going on. This one here is telling you what's going on in there, but it's also reminding you how the basic email should go. Again, keeping the email simple helps the educator understand where your heart's intentions go and what the needs are very quickly. It helps you to look at it quickly and seeing if you're following up properly on those items. It just keeps everything clear and tight, okay? And then what you're gonna have in your binder for your printouts, um, you're going to have, um, so the section requests for, uh, for evaluations, if there's request forms that you have to sign, you can get copies, great. If not, like you don't always get those things um, and the consent to evaluate where you're signing off on stuff. The reason why I'm saying that is because when my youngest went in for a psych ed assessment through our district, um, I had my copy, but they lost theirs. And then when we found it after a couple months, it was filed someplace in accounting. It was bizarre in the office. And so having those copies really become important. Then when we found it, it was found that it wasn't even sent in, the request didn't even get in. So it was just this thing that was like, because I kept a record, we were able to trail back really well. Your section on IEPs, I want you to keep one your last copy of the year before in there, if you've had previous IEPs. So you keep your last copy so you can carry over because of why some of those goals flow over. Some of the language needs to flow over. Sometimes you need to go back to them and re-implement them. There's different things that have to happen. Then you're gonna print off your policy manuals, the guidelines procedure. The one I keep talking about, that's gonna be your link there. Also what you're gonna get in your email is a sheet that says parent input. And basically it's the outline of everything I've been talking about. It's gonna talk about, give you the ability to write out your child's strengths, your child's challenges, the child, top three wishes for your child, top three concerns and any additional comments. You also get a couple of handouts that if your children are younger on helping getting them and their voice involved. So between probably K to six, this, these two documents will work for you and pulling out their voice and getting them involved in that process for you. So you're gonna have those documents with you once it's all said and done to start populating your binder and giving you that framework to go with. Your binder is good for one year. Just keep it for a year, then file it and hold it for a year. Don't hold all 12 binders and store them and think Lee's gonna want the binders. Lee's not gonna want the binders. Some of our kids actually get hurt by what they see in the IEPs, to be honest with you, because the discussions are, are very sensitive. And some times we don't catch the language and realize, oh my gosh, that was, a kind, of, that was kind of damaging. So we don't want our kids to see it. Don't leave your binders laying around, that's private information. Keep it for one year only, 
and then get rid of it afterwards, shred it. Please make sure in your binder, when you have the, um, the diagnostic uh, assessment in there, take a black Sharpie, scratch out your child's name, the pen, all those things that are really, really important because if you accidentally misplace that binder, you've given away a lot of personal information in that content. So I want you to scratch that stuff out so it's not available. You know who this person is. You don't, and, and this is going to be a copy. It's not going to be the original document. So you scratch that stuff out and make sure it's all redacted for you, right? So all that being said, where I move to all the time is this thought process. And this is kind of like my drum that I beat, that inclusion is not a program. It's a mindset, a social integration, how we treat others. It's how we come together and how we use language and empathy to matter. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. What you have here is a point of contact for me. I've done, again, a TEDx talk that's on YouTube. You can reach me through my email. My Facebook business page is literally this, Suzanne Pearl, Counselor and Inclusive Ed Consultant Presenter. It's all of that, it's not just Suzanne Pearl. Suzanne Pearl to me, chances are I'm not gonna accept you as a friend, um, but <laughs> you're welcome to go on my counseling page. Um, and so tonight you're going to have some, some of you may not want to ask questions because you don't feel comfortable and that's okay. Please feel free to reach out in the background. I'll be happy to navigate those questions through uh, messenger or however that works for you. And so Chris, I'm back to you. Great. Thank you. Suzanne. Thanks uh, so much for the presentation. I mean, there was, I think for me anyway, so many uh, points throughout the the dialogue there where your um, your experience and your insights um, really uh, came through and a lot of valuable information and, and, and perspectives in there, I'm sure, for everyone. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I know we're running a bit behind time, but I, I do want to give people a chance if they did have any questions uh, top of mind to, to ask them. So if anyone has a question uh, at this stage, uh, please feel free to jump in. any hands. I'll just give it another second or two just in case. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you so much, Suzanne, for taking the time and, and sharing uh, your presentation with us. And, um, and I certainly would encourage uh, anyone that, that has questions, as Suzanne said, to uh, um, follow up. And, um, and it looks like uh, there's been some links that are, have been shared in the chat as well, and, and uh, that those, those will get posted also. So thank you, Suzanne. Perfect. Wonderful. And again, feel free to reach out to me through social media, and I'll be happy to connect with you if you need. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me into your space and helping me to feel welcome and be present here with you. Thank you so much. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll now move on to the report part of the agenda. And um, first uh, on the agenda, we've got a report uh, this evening from uh, uh, Superintendent's report, but being uh, uh, here on uh, Harry's behalf uh, tonight, I think we have uh, Yovo, uh, the Assistant Superintendent. So Yovo, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. It's nice to see everyone. Um, and uh, I also want to echo the comments on Suzanne's uh, presentation. I think she did a wonderful job of uh, kind of talking about the complexity of uh, being you know, involved in an IEP process, and uh, but also how to be a key partner in it because parents know their kids best. So uh, I, I loved her image too of experiencing that success in what her child wrote and, and drew there. Um, so most of my uh, updates, and I do send regrets on behalf of Harry Dillon, uh, he, uh, he needed to tend to a, um, a parent uh, or a family matter himself. Um, and uh, so um, he uh, gave me some updates to share with you. And mine are pretty much all uh, COVID related. Uh, so kind of uh, a the theme of our times right now. Um, I know that we have many other things that are happening and positive things happening in our school district, but I, th I know that that's top of mind for many people right now. And I wanted to make sure that uh, we gave you those updates. So uh, currently, um, as many of you already have, your children uh, have been wearing masks in schools as a result of the uh, updated mask guidelines. And uh, overall, that's gone well and it's been successful. And uh, kids are from grade of four to seven uh, and from grade eight to 12 uh, are wearing masks. Um, and in situations where 
um, kids are unable to uh, for different reasons. They're still being included uh, and being part of the school community, uh, as is also set out in the guidelines by the ministry and in what is good inclusive practices. And much of what Suzanne spoke about uh, is you know near and dear to what we are as a district, and I think that needs to be uh, something that's uh, done now as much as ever. Um, it's interesting how you know now we're being inclusive of those that are not wearing masks, is similar to when. Um, those that were wearing masks at a time when they weren't mandated. And so, but uh, by far the majority of kids, our staff are wearing them as required. Uh, and then even in K to three, many kids are wearing those uh, masks. Um, in terms of the notifications, I'm sure some of you have experienced uh, yourselves as parents and as family members. I know I have. I have two kids in school here, uh, one in grade 8, eight one in grade 11. Uh, and they've received uh, notifications uh, here in Maple Ridge. And um, we've seen an increase of those uh, as a result of the increase in transmission in the community right now. Um, and they've actually changed some of the processes a little bit too. Uh, we're seeing more self monitors and self isolations. And one of the, uh, besides the fact that we are seeing an increasing in, um, as uh, you know, Fraser Health is reporting and transmission in the community, um, they've lowered the threshold too for self isolation and for self monitoring. So because of the uh, variants, uh, Fraser Health has actually um, increased the number of times that they're asking people to self isolate to really decrease the opportunity for the virus to transmit. And so uh, they're also working more closely in terms of sharing information and then us sharing information back about the level of interaction that's happening in our schools between students uh, so that we're sharing that information as part of their contact tracing process. Um, and so we're seeing some case, uh, cases that classes are being asked to self-isolate, uh, especially in our primary grades because of the level of interaction that happens there with little, little ones. Um, and um, the, I also just received uh, um, uh, an update on some of the transmission and, uh, rates and some of the uh, research that they're doing um, through the Fraser Health Region and the Vancouver Health Region. And uh, although we are seeing a large number of and high numbers of uh, uh, COVID um, right now in the community, um, they're still seeing lower uh, transmission rates in schools overall, which is, I think, why they're using the science to determine uh, what level at which and what right type of reaction that they're going to need to do to be able to keep uh, things um, at bay. Um, so they are being very diligent about the process of notifying and asking people to isolate, um, yet the transmission rates they're saying uh, they're reporting to us are, are lower in schools and much higher in the community. Um, so uh, we, we're doing everything we can to make sure that all of those health and safety guidelines are being followed. We've asked principals to continue to review those, to update those, review them with their staffs. And as you know, it's stressful for teachers as well. And they're, they're um, being quite diligent about it, uh, but also trying to make sure it's very inclusive. Um, in terms of uh, the um, way that they were getting the notifications, they're batching them now. So what mean, that means is that they issue them at 10 o'clock and at three o'clock each day. And so at 10 o'clock, uh, we will receive notifications and at three o'clock, and then that's when we begin the actual notification process and distribute those as needed uh, through the principal and working with the principal on making sure that it's uh, distributed to people that need to, to get it. And so that's why you're probably seeing that when notifications come out, there's a certain pattern to when they do come out. Uh, and that's through the weekends as well. Uh, so every day at 10 and three, uh, we're monitoring our emails and checking those. And, uh, you know, we, I'm on call during the weekends as well. And I'm assisting with those as well as the others of us in the district office to make sure that uh, that's timely and that we get the information out as effectively as possible to our families and for our students. Um, one of the other updates uh, we are working through and getting guidance around graduation ceremonies. I know that grads are a big piece of uh, the celebration that happens um, for our grade 12s and uh, those are in process. Um, we have to make sure we're following the, ga the gathering orders. Um, I don't have a lot of detail to share on that front, 
uh, just to know that it is in process and there are plans being established um, so that there is some form of celebration for those grade 12s, um, but also following the fact that we can't be gathering in large groups. Uh, so there's some virtual and some other types of ideas that are being explored um, that, uh, that will hopefully honor and, uh, the work that these kids have done and be a celebration with families. Grade seven, similarly, we're providing and creating guidelines as, as, we, as we speak. We had a meeting with uh, uh, elementary principals today, myself actually, and uh, we led discussion on the grade seven ceremonies, uh, recognizing that grade seven ceremonies are not a graduation, that you know we wanna keep that uh, to be uh, a recognition, but not it's not that level of celebration and uh, not that level of expectation that we should be putting on families and, and kids and uh, you know having them grow up too fast. So we want there to be some level of recognition and both but also work within the COVID protocols that we have to follow. Uh, and, uh, you know, my son just finished grade seven last year and, you know, his, his opportunities were impacted, uh, but at the same time, we found a way to, as a family to, to identify that and, and do that uniquely for him as well. Um, in terms of secondary planning, uh, we do have uh, planning underway. Uh, we are waiting for some more guidance again from the ministry to say, what we need to do in terms of cohorts. Uh, what we are planning at this point is that all schools will be semestered next year, uh, not quarter system, uh, unless we are asked to shift to a quarter system if, uh, if things uh, change for us. I mean, I'm being hopeful, and I think all of us are being hopeful that things will return to as normal as possible for September as the vaccine rolls out. And, and uh, you know, but at the same time, we're being asked to ensure that we're being able to be prepared in case things do change. Um, and so the schools are planning for a semester system and we've had different uh, bits of feedback. I know that we've had some uh, focus groups with students to hear their feedback on uh, the quarter system and, and to be planning for the future. But I know that, you know, quarter system is very intense. My, my daughter and my son doing it. It's been uh, interesting for them and hearing from other parents and other kids. And, and uh, you know, it's the semester system is what we're going to be going towards next year. And that will hopefully uh, meet the needs uh, of what we need to do to, to adapt if we need to, but also meet the needs of our students and our families and uh, you know, provide the best educational opportunity possible. And then into next year, we'll, uh, as Shannon Dorinzi, who helps oversee a uh, secondary, she uh, was saying uh, earlier today, to, we, the goal is to have some conversations um, at the secondary level to talk about semestered and see you know what is the future after that going to look like and what is it that we need to be doing because there's pulses and minuses to all types of systems and we want to try and provide the, the best opportunities and the diverse opportunities that many of our kids also represent. Uh, Flex um, is uh, still being considered to be reinstated uh, was something that was in our high schools for those of you who have high school uh, kids. Um, that flex will not be at the beginning or the end of the day. Uh, it'll be between classes uh, and about the same length as it was uh, in the past. And we're also looking at trying to create some consistent um, schedules in terms of starts and end times. But obviously there's flexibility and uh, different cultures and schools like our IB program at Garibaldi um, and others that, you know, and Thomas Haney, our unique uh, program at Thomas Haney and self-paced model. So there's things that are adaptive for those schools, but uh, they're looking at ways to ensure that, uh, you know, they, they can provide some consistency to across the district. Um, in terms of uh, our remote programs, um, we, they've, I have to say, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about our remote programs uh, in the school district uh, and providing an educational opportunity for our kids. We currently have 350 students in elementary remote. Uh, the vast majority um, are in school. Uh, so if, if you take those 350, and that's K to seven, kindergarten to grade seven, we have 350 students in remote. Uh, that represents about 4% of our 9,200 uh, elementary students. So 96% of our students are actually uh, in class. Um, and so they're, um, the, um, which is much higher than our neighboring districts. And a lot of districts we have, we're hearing 90% is about the attendance rate. And uh, we have 33 students on, at our KC school. Uh, we have over 100 students in our Odyssey program. Uh, 40 of those students are returning for September. Um, and we have some families that are opting for Odyssey, and I'll talk a little bit about more than a sec that in a second. Uh, we have 60 students in our grade eight and nine 
uh, uh, remote program, which is a, has de been decreasing throughout the year. Uh, we've heard actually some students are opting to take that last quarter and give it a try, get into classes uh, and, um, and attend for that last quarter. And we've got about 12 homeschool. We have 12 home, uh, students in homeschool that we're reaching out to to see what they're considering for uh, September. Um, so for September, um, our remote program it was uh, developed as a result of having the need but it was staffed and supported through federal funding. And so we received, uh, like all school districts received federal funding to allow to adapt to what was needed for remote. And what we did was what was unique again in our school district was we kept the seats for our students in their school so they could return easily. And then if they needed to have the remote option for this year, and we can only do that by uh, the federal funding that was in place. And so as a result, uh, you know, we're looking forward to having your kids back in school. We're looking forward to having them back in the classes where they can have their learning needs met. And as Suzanne presented, have a very inclusive uh, opportunity, but also looking at how to support that. And we're hoping that uh, next week when the uh, uh, provincial government uh, um, tables their budget that we're going to see some uh, funds that would help with that support but at the same time we've actually uh, in the budget proposal put uh, some funds ahead in terms of the cleaning that's required for next year uh, already to just uh, if we need to have it and I would likely we will the extra cleaning from September to um, to December, as well as having um, supports for transition uh, and the mental health strategies that we want to have for many of our, our families and our, our kids uh, to be able to support that transition back. Um, and what we're hoping is we're going to see some additional funds from the provincial government to be able to help support that. Um, and so the Odyssey, if there, for those families that feel that they really feel they need uh, an option that looks like remote, Odyssey is an option. And so we communicated and sent an email to all of our remote families uh, through our principals and from, from myself actually, who helped oversee the remote program. And we provided them with the information to say, if, if remote was really working and it's something you really want for September, you can transfer to the Odyssey program. And we do have seats available. Um, we're sitting at around uh, the last intake I saw were just over 80 students. Uh, and again, we accommodated over 110 this year. And so we could grow to that. And so we still have seats available if parents really feel strongly. And that program runs from K to nine um, for, for families. And uh, so it's uh, something where they would be part of uh, intake and, and have an opportunity to learn more about it. So, um, so those are some of the main things that I needed to provide you updates on. I think Elaine's on the call, uh, I believe, and I thought I saw Mike as well. And I, I'm not sure if one of them will be speaking to the uh, budget, but the budget meeting was last night uh, through the board uh, and there is a feedback process, but uh, Elaine or Mike, maybe you'll speak to that more. And if, if needed, I can also speak to it a little bit as well. But uh, um, thank you for the opportunity for me to share some of those updates uh, from the district. There's again, many, many more things happening in our school district, but I know COVID is top of mind for everyone. And, um, we're doing everything we can to make, maintain safety and care and empathy, compassion, um, and really try to provide uh, a way to meet the learning needs of all of our students and our families. Thanks, Yovo. Uh, anyone have any questions for Yovo before I move on to the trustees report? Okay, um, and I know I, I saw... Um, uh, Trustee Murray and Trustee Yamamoto, uh, there may be others as well. I'm not sure what, who is, is uh, designated to speak on behalf of the trustees uh, tonight, but uh, whoever it is, over to you. Is that to you, Elaine? <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, it, I, I'm, uh, I'm on board this evening. Um, <laughs> Trustee Murray was uh, actually just before this uh, chairing another provincial meeting at of our um, at our annual general meeting of uh, trustees and the, um, the candidates running for directors of, of uh, BCSTA. Um, I got to change my view because a very large picture of my face just came up and that was not <laughs> appealing to me. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, Yovo touched on a few things in the budget, but it is budget time for us. Um, at our public meeting last night, we received the uh, draft of the 21-22 um, budget. Um, it's um, 93 
pages or so. Um, it, but it is a good read. <laughs> um, it was created um, with uh, input from our partners at QP and MRTA, our principal vice principals association and your DPAC and our students uh, representatives. Um, it's available on our website and it's right in the header. Um, there's a link and you will find the full document, but what's really great is there's also a YouTube <laughs> of our uh, secretary treasurer uh, going over the highlights of the budget um, and uh, where she talks about the budget background, the, um, the, fun the funding that we are expecting, um, our, our costs and our four-year budget projections. Um, she also covers the changes um, that are being proposed for next year. So I know everyone's busy uh, parents, uh, you know, you can just, hey, no Netflix tonight, folks. We're going to watch our secretary treasurer present our budget, you know. Um, the, uh, the website also gives you uh, opportunities as parents to uh, complete a survey on um, the highlights or what you feel is important in the budget. Um, I have been flipping back and forth to the website tonight from the meeting and I've actually the numbers have been going up. The last I saw, I just updated my notes to 131 responses. So that is great that people are, are looking at it and uh, contributing because um, we will read all of your comments. Um, there's a new ideas button on, on the website as well. So if you um, don't want to go through the full survey, you can, you can just pop in, pop in your thoughts uh, directly, which is, which is great. Um, those are all collated and we um, are taken into consideration and we as trustees read them all as well before we, we go to uh, approve the bud final budget. Um, every year is a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, this year is um, no different. Um, we've taken some income uh, revenue hits um, in a net loss in funding, um, some drop in our international education program, obviously, um, the income that that brings in and our public uh, facilities rentals incomes are, are down as well. Um, I think right across the district, all the departments were asked to see where they could uh, create a little bit of savings, um, including, um, hey, we trustees have, uh, you know, there's 31,000 in professional development opportunities that we haven't been able to um, fully take advantage of um, uh, with the, or they've become free for us on the online process. So, you know, every, that's just right across the board though. I know everyone is looking to where they can prioritize their spending. Um, further complication, as Yovo mentioned, is that last year, you know, we received at the very last minute, um, a generous uh, uh, funding from the federal government and provincial government to help us cope with the, the needs around COVID. Um, we haven't heard yet if there is any supplemental um, uh, funding coming. So we are budgeting within what we see as our envelope right at the moment. Um, the provincial budget doesn't even come down till the 20th of April because last year was an election. Last fall we had the election, so the the budget is uh, a, a little bit out of uh, out of sync. But we'll know on the 20th if we are going to get extra funding for that. Um, but out of prudence, our our finance department budgets toward the basically the worst case scenario. Um, what they are not giving up on is, as Yovo mentioned, what we need to do to keep the, make, ensure that our schools are safe um, in this COVID era for, for everyone. Um, and Yovo also mentioned the, uh, the gradual return and the remote uh, schooling that was funded from the federal government money. It's actually, it's because we're holding, we were able to hold seats in the classroom that, was still um, a T 
teacher that took part of a teacher and we duplicated by creating the, a, a remote team to for the for the children that um, whose circumstances were not uh, didn't make it possible for them to return right away. Um, also in, taken into consideration is understanding that when we get back into school in September, there is going to be fallout from this uh, this past year on uh, in an, an extra need for additional emotional support for our children and the families to to sort of get back into the rhythm and hopefully a nor a normal rhythm. Um, we're we're ready to make that investment in in the mental health. Um, a few things I, I won't go on too long, but the families might want to note because it is it is a it's a very fulsome document that there are a couple of programs under review. That's the uh, there is funding for it. It's, we're not changing the funding, but elementary fine arts, the elementary band program, a feeder program for our secondary schools, is under will be a, not an outside review, but they will be. But as a district, we will be looking at that program and how it's uh, serving our children and um, the subsidization of school transportation. Our numbers were understandably very low this year. Um, we will be reviewing it to see whether next year to see whether or not the numbers bounce back and and how um, that subsidy how well placed that subsidization is. So um, those are two for direct impacts potentially for families that I wanted to highlight. Um, bottom line is there is a there is a deficit in this budget and we're fortunate enough because of previous prudent plan financial planning uh, from our department that we have do have a 3.39 million dollar balance in a contingency fund. So we are taking um, 1.67 million of that out of our local contingency fund and 250,000 out of our operating contingency contingency reserves so that we can as we are required uh, uh, deliver offer a, a, a balanced budget for for the ministry um, we are at as a as a board advocating for the funding that we need for the like definitely and across the province all the trustees are putting on pressure trying to get the additional funding that we need to ensure that we're COVID safe um, uh, and just final point reminder again the, the the survey is open it's right on our header on our on, on our website it's open till the 29th on the 28th we'll again hear from our our partners they they give us great input from from the different perspectives and um, then on May 5th we will be um, approving our budget balancing proposals and the budget gets adopted on the 16th so um, I won't go further into the annual general meeting because it won't it doesn't uh, apply directly I also noticed when I was looking at um, the BC CDC site that there is an update um, on, on there from the uh, the school sector update, and there they also have a survey, um, a second province-wide uh, COVID nineteen survey where they're looking for um, feedback from families on their experiences in the uh, this past year in the educational sector. So that's uh, it from the trustees, uh, Mike. Unless you have something else to add, he he was he is. Brain must be blowing up. <laughs> I think you've uh, done a, a great job. Okay. I think put a link on the uh, chat as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll just pause here, see if there's any questions or comments for, um, for Elaine or for Mike uh, before we move on. Okay, thanks very much, Elaine, for the, um, the report, and thanks both for making the time to be here with us uh, this evening. Uh, now over to Maple Ridge uh, Teachers Association. Um, I think I saw Martin earlier. I don't know, Trevor, if you're here as well, but I, I think I saw Martin. Yeah, there he is. 
I'm here, yeah. And uh, I thought I'd uh, start by kind of transitioning right off of Elaine's uh, statement on the budget. I do really encourage, uh, you know, um, not only our own teachers, but also um, uh, parents out there to provide feedback on the budget. You know, the budget may be in some ways for some out there boring because it's a bunch of numbers on a page, but it is a reflection of the priorities of what we want to see in our schools and that's obviously very important because it it funds all the services we see there and uh not only uh can you work within your you know uh, uh, partnership groups but uh, um i always really highly recommend to our teachers um and it should be no different with parents as well that they can advocate as uh, independently on their own as they see fit as well so not only is there the ability to um access and provide feedback on the budget through the, uh, the survey. But uh, there's also an ability to do written submissions, um, as well as to sign up to take part in the uh, budget committee of the whole meeting, um, which I see, I'm just looking here, um, April 28th, I believe, uh, that uh, members of the general public can also um, kind of speak to it if they so choose. So uh, kind of little bits of information on that. I'm going to put that in the chat. That's also a separate page on the website. But, uh, you know, um, also, uh, it's great that in our day and age of easy access to information, if you missed the meeting last night on the budget presentation, there's those great links so that you can watch it all over again or um, for the first time on YouTube as well. Um, as well as the, the document, uh, you know, the executive summary, that's the 92 pages you can um, read through and, and get a, a bit of an understanding of, of what's been uh, prioritized for our next year. Um, so aside from the, the budget process, the only other piece I wanted to share for tonight uh, was that we do have something coming up and I mentioned this in a previous meeting, but we're getting closer to the actual event. This is the May 12th convention date. Um, in schools, we'll have a few uh, guest speakers, one of which will uh, be doing an evening session with parents. Um, and so uh, on May 12th, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., we have a special guest speaker uh, that, that uh, parents will have access to. His name is Dr. Michael Unger. Um, and here I moved my email uh, link because I had the memo right up, to, uh, giving a little bit of a low down here. Let's make sure that I can find that. Give me a, a second here, apologies. Um, oops. Anyways, uh, he will be talking, I do recall, his, his topic is on the resiliency of, of our, our, our kids in schools and, and building resiliency in children. Um, and so those are some of his main topics. If you search for him on YouTube, you'll find a few good links to get a sense of what he is like as a speaker. So Dr. Michael Unger um, is his name. And uh, I think like we, uh, there's a wealth of information um, from uh, some of those um, experts out there. I, I certainly uh, appreciated uh, Suzanne Perot's uh, um, presentation tonight. So there's a lot that can be learned from, from some of these presenters. So I encourage uh, parents to take part. Thank you. And I'll take questions if anyone has any. All right, any questions for Martin? Okay, thanks very much, Martin. Um, QP, I'm not sure who's here from QP, but uh, QP, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisette Beckham, and I have been in this meeting uh, before. Um, Jason, unfortunately, cannot make it tonight. Um, so I will keep it short and sweet, <laughs> uh, being mindful of the time. Um, the only thing that we want to share from QP is that... Um, as we have been hearing, is budget time. Um, QP has uh, presented some proposals and one of them is uh, before and after school care. Um, if you want to know more details about this plan, please contact Jason. Um, he will be more than happy to share um, all the information. As well, tonight with me is uh, Paul Evans. 
Uh, he's one of my co-workers. He works in the IT department. Um, I don't know, Paul, do you uh, have anything to share? Uh, no, nope. I just, it's my first meeting and I uh, just basically taking taking it, paying attention. That's what I'm doing tonight uh, to let the parents know that we are, IT is, uh, has to have priority to get the teachers uh, teaching with teaching devices out and our students devices out giving as many uh, devices as we can out to our school kids not much more than that well, yeah thanks thanks Paul. and um, just to close um, I will echo um, what Martin from MRTA and Elaine from this uh, trustees have um, stated. The survey is out for the budget. So please, um, if you have a, a chance to um, fill it out and submit it, that will be awesome. Um, the more voices um, that the school district hears, the better. So yeah, that's it. Great, thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, uh, slide to the treasurer's report. Do we have anyone from um, Principals and Vice Principals Association? I'll just check first. Okay, doesn't sound like it. Yeah, so treasurer's report, simply now with you. Okay, give me the slides because I'm just going to read them from there. <laughs> Okay, so for a gaming account, we have $4,034.25. Um, we had a couple of checks uh, written in March and for our presentations um, for April and for March and April. Um, for, and our general account stands the same at $5,774.38 for a total of $9,808.63 as of March 30th. Not the I just realized I'm on mute. Um, any questions for Polina? Okay, uh, BTC pack, ADM, and uh, registration and proxy info. Chris or Tanya, is that you? Uh, either or. Um, Tanya, do you, do you want to talk to it or? Oh, here I am. Hi there. Uh, so BCC PACS AGM is coming up and it is on May 1st. Uh, there are quite a few resolutions that have been put forward. One person from each of the PACs shown on your screen is eligible to vote. You do need to register and submit a proxy by this Monday, April 19th. Um, so this is where it's mostly business for AGM. And then the conference, which is educational for parents, is, the, is May 28th and 29th, and those are on Zoom as well. Uh, and also, I have been nominated for BCC PAC as both vice, first vice president and uh, director. So it'd be great if you could vote for me. And uh, I think that's about it. You do need to register by the 19th. Um, as many people as you want can attend, but only one person per PAC can vote or speak. Okay, is there any questions? Yeah, and, I, and I'll just add too that there was some confusion with what uh, proxy meant. Oh, sorry, I had my finger. And so every pack that wants to attend the meeting has to fill out a proxy. The proxy has two terms. Proxy is sort of a registration and proxy is to hand your vote off to someone else if you can't make it. So there was a lot of confusion that people were, you know, either not handing their vote off or whatever. If you are attending, you must fill out the proxy. Um, and like Tanya said, uh, you can have your entire executive go to the AGM. Uh, when you fill out the proxy, you state that you're there to speak or 
for the one person that's there to vote. So the person that's there to vote fill out, fills out the vote portion of the proxy and everyone else can can uh, speak to any of the resolutions, speak to any of the motions, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know, we'd like to see as many as many packs as present as possible. If are there any of our SD42 packs that uh, that do uh, that are unable to go, um, yeah, please let uh, Tanya know uh, if you'd like to pass uh, your proxy of that portion of the proxy off to us. Otherwise, we'd really like to see every pack from SD42 um, represented at uh, BCC pack. Great. Uh, next is a nomination for the DPAC executives. And so our nominations are coming up. Our elections are in June. Uh, all the positions are available uh, to be nominated. Um, before we kind of get to that point, we do need a nominating committee. So I know that uh, we are we have been assisting other PACs uh, in the district, um, acting as their nominating committee. Um, but what we really need is uh, someone to act for our nominating committee uh, so that uh, the executive doesn't have to do it. So again, we'd like to ask our DPAC reps, well, we can certainly help provide uh, best practices if you don't know what to do or whatever and give some information on how to run a nominating committee. It's fairly simple. You, you accept the nominations uh, as, an, as independent uh, from the executive and then report that back to the membership and then uh, call the election. So if there's anybody interested in learning about that or doing that for us, um, that would be really helpful. We wanna have that third uh, that third party sort of uh, in charge of those uh, elections. Um, and if you, if you don't know what to do, please let us know. We can uh, um, show some great uh, information on, um, on how that might be able to do. And it's certainly help you along as much as we can without making, you know, uh, interfering or, uh, trying to direct the nominating committee. So again, please, please consider that. And if there's anybody who's willing to be on the nominating committee uh, for us again this year, uh, please email us and let us know. Great, thanks Chris. And then on to new business, the upcoming uh, service dinner. And uh, this is something that came up at our last executive meeting. We weren't able to do this last year. Um, what we're hoping is that uh, we're able to do this again this year uh, in a virtual format. Um, it's still gonna be on Zoom, but what we're hoping at and looking at uh, trying to do for our May meeting is still have our upcoming Longtime Service Achievement Award for any parent uh, to be nominated by uh, another parent or another PAC, uh, well, from a, from a pack and um, for anybody graduating whose last child is graduating out of grade 12 uh, for their recognition uh, for their years uh, being involved in uh, in their school communities or in their packs, uh, that kind of thing. We're also looking at possibly doing uh, 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 DoorDash type uh, coupon thing for attendees, uh, 30 to 40 ten attendees. We're still kind of, we, we're going to be working out the details, but we'll be getting that information out as soon as possible and the information on uh, nominating a parent for um, uh, for the uh, Longtime Service Achievement Award so that we can recognize those parents uh, who are graduating out for their for their years of service. Okay, now uh, before we go to PAC Voice, we've got a motion to renew our Zoom license. So look for a mover for that. Anyone? Hands scrolling through. I'll just, if you have your hand up and I'm not seeing you, but I'm not seeing hands. Oh, there we go, Glenwood and uh, Sander. Oh, there we go. Uh, I can't see. Um, Oh, looks like that's uh, Garibaldi secondary. Um, thank you. So, okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, I'll, I'll launch. The I'll, I'll bring up just a quick discussion just before we vote. Um, our, our Zoom license that we've had for the last year uh, expires, uh, I believe, at the end of June. So, uh, and the 
the, depending on when you go into Zoom to look to renew it, it's anywhere from $140 to $220, depending on what their marketing tells you you can get a deal on. Last time I looked, it was $140, so we might be able to get it for that. But so far, uh, I know for the packs who are using it, um, for your pack meetings and executive meetings and whatever that you, you've been using it for, uh, I think uh, we've well gotten our money's worth over the year. There's a very good chance that uh, that's going to continue, uh, at least in some way, shape or form. So um, I'd just like to speak to this motion. Um, I think it's been, and hopefully that the packs that have been using it find that it's valuable as well. And uh, yeah, I, I vote in favor of, uh, of extending that for another year. All right, any other comments? Otherwise I'll launch the poll. Go. Give it five more seconds here. Okay, and that carries. Okay, so with that, uh, we are into Pack Voice. Does anyone have anything to share for Pack Voice? I'm not hearing anything, and we're 9.02, which is uh, uh, at the very least two minutes past where we'd ideally like to be, if not a bit more. So great time to do a motion to adjourn. Uh, can I get a mover for the motion to adjourn? Yep, uh, uh, Katie, move, DSS uh, second. Any discussion? I will launch the poll. And there we go, we're adjourned. Thank you so much everyone for all the time. Apologies it went uh, a bit over time, but I think that was a very uh, uh, helpful and informative presentation from uh, Suzanne. So thanks for making the time and uh, we'll see you all um, as uh, is up on the screen there. Um, actually, I think you have outdated, but we'll see you at the next meeting. <laughs> yeah, I did the copy and paste. It's May 20th is the next meeting. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Nice to see you, Katie. Bye. Bye, everybody. Good to see everyone. Thanks, Jovo. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thank you for the invitation and for letting me be here. Anytime. Thank you. Yeah. How's Jackson doing? He's, he's good. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Good to hear. Yeah. yeah. yeah How are you? Good? I'm, good? I'm good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Say hi to him for me. I will for sure. Take care. Bye. See you later. Bye.